Mommy, I'm feeling cold. I understand, sweetheart. I know. I just want to go to sleep. No, no. Stay awake for just another hour. It will be sunny soon. But I can already see the sun coming out. It all began a few months ago when my family decided to embark on an Alaskan tour for a family road trip. My husband, Stephen, 32 years old, was taking my daughter Lana, 15, and me, Carol, 32 years old, on a trip we would never forget. It started out fantastic as we took a cruise around the state, marveling at the amazing lights and scenery. We were supposed to stay there for a few weeks. On our last week, we got off the ship and checked into a hotel as my husband wanted to experience the city life. This is where things get blurry. The next thing I remember is we were in our car rental, and I was extremely tired. I couldn't move, could barely breathe, and the heater in the car wasn't helping my hot flashes. I tried calling out to Stephen, but he wouldn't answer. In the corner of my eye, I saw him focused solely on the road. I tried calling out to him again, but Stephen barely acknowledged me. He began shaking his head, and Lana, tilting my head back, I could see my daughter sprawled across the back seats of the car, passed out. I'm sorry, Stephen, pained out. I'm sorry it had to be this way. I needed an out, and I just. I can't pretend anymore. What are you talking about? My entire body was numb, my lips barely moving. What was wrong with me? He began shaking his head faster, as if another thought had come to him. You trapped us, Carol. You, not me. Why am I saying sorry? Stephen's words confused me. What's wrong? Oh, don't act like you care now. I, I had to do this. I was getting tired again, but I was curious to understand what he had done. I want to restart in life and I can't do that with you too attached at my hip. He sounded crazy. It was barely clicking in my head. Honey, what? What are you saying? It was you, okay? You and Lana ruined any possible amount of happiness I could have. Sure, I had a part in being careless, but hey, we were young and dumb. And then you got pregnant at 17 years old. What else could be worse? I wanted to put her up for adoption, start a new right then and there. But no, you wanted to keep her, and I stayed out of pity, ignoring my feelings. Look what you have done. I have let it fester far too long. It's my turn to be. Be selfish. And like you, I'm not asking for permission. This. This. Not once had you mentioned you were unhappy. Why should I? He answered sarcastically, you had our whole life planned for us as soon as we graduated high school. What? Where are you taking us? I still couldn't believe what was happening. I was barely processing my surroundings or what Stephen was going to do was was he going to kill us. That wouldn't make sense. I have known this man nearly all my life, and not once has he shown signs of being deranged. When he didn't respond, I asked a different question are you going to kill us? I couldn't believe I was asking this, but his reaction was not granting me any security. I wish I could, but I can't stomach it. It wasn't all bad either, we had fun times. But a man can only fake it for so long. After that, I blacked out. He must have drugged our drinks while at the hotel. Since Lana was younger and smaller, she wouldn't fight against the drug more than I did. When I woke up, I was lying in a pile of snow in the middle of the woods and mountaintops. I looked to my right and saw Lana barely waking up as well, dotting her eyes with the corner of her fingers. Mom, where are we? Where's Dad? I didn't know what to say. I wanted to pretend like everything Stephen and I spoke about in the car was a horrible, terrible, bad dream, but it was real. I wanted to cry, to sob my eyes out of anger, sadness, and frustration. But I had to remind myself that I had to stay strong for her, for us to survive. Dad did this. What are you talking about? For the next 10 minutes, I tried explaining to her what he had told me and what that meant for us.
she couldn't believe it. My heart ached for her. She was only 15 years old, a freshman in high school, and now she was faced with the possibility of death because her father was crazy. Maybe this was all my fault. These thoughts plagued my brain for a while. She began crying and didn't stop for about 20 minutes. I held her to me, letting her weep for the both of us. This can't be real. This can't be. Dad's coming back. I wish I was lying, baby, but I don't think he is. What? What are we going to do? She hiccuped. I don't know. We knew we couldn't stay in the spot in fear of freezing to death, so we began walking. But to where? To what end? If starvation or the weather didn't kill us, a wild animal most certainly would. After a few hours of blistering our hands, we made a fire. It had a hard time staying lit, but luckily, I enrolled Lana in a survival camp when she was in middle school, so those skills came in handy. In the coming weeks, we lived off of wild berries and snow. We were extremely malnourished, but that didn't stop us from trying to stay alive. We were bound to come across wild animals, and when we did, we were not lucky. A three-pack of wolves came to us, and unfortunately, Lana was terribly bit on the leg. The only reason we survived was I found a log large enough to catch on fire and hurled it their way, causing them to scram in fear. The snow wasn't melting anytime soon. Right above Lana's ankle was engorged with a large and deep bite mark. We didn't know what to do. What if the next pack comes our way? What if a bear? Anything and everything could be around the corner. In some ways, it was a good thing, this was the first time we saw an animal. I helped with Lana's wounds as best as I could, wrapping it securely with the only fabric I had on my back. My soil-stained t-shirt was marked with dirt, blood, and sand. I zipped my winter coat all the way up my neck. The bleeding eventually stopped, but now I was worried about infection. She was in great pain and much stress. I didn't know what to do. We began to hear howling in the distance, and she began to cry. Mommy, I'm so scared. She began calling me mommy the second day we were in the woods, and I reveled in it. I finally had an idea. We were going to climb one of the trees so that no large animal could come our way. But considering we barely had food in our stomachs and were down a few tools, it was a complex process to get up the tree. For the next 30 minutes, we tortured our way up the trunk. She screamed in pain, and I tried my best to calm her so as not to attract attention. When we were high enough, I noted the pluses and minuses of being up here. We could see much easier across the skyline. The reason we hadn't done this sooner was the lack of warmth. We had no fire and no nearby food except a few handfuls of berries tucked into our pockets. We would have to come down eventually, but how, with Lana's injury? I couldn't comprehend how much time she had left if she were to die of infection or the weather conditions. She began to whine daily from the pain and the cold. I only allowed her to sleep when the sun was out, just in case the absence of it made her stay asleep and never awake again. I slept a few hours here and there but never long enough to regenerate me. When I checked her wound, I noticed it turned a gangly greenish color. I was growing increasingly worried. When she wasn't paying attention, I would cry softly. If she saw my weakness, she would very much give up entirely. We were getting weaker, tired, and hungrier. I didn't know what else to do except pray. The bright side of being on top of the tree was that I could see farther along and wide. In the distance, I could swear I saw artificial light flickering. I could be imagining things, but that was a start. That night, I decided that I was going to have to venture out alone to get help. Whatever extra clothing I had on me, I gave to her, my thermal underwear, socks strapped across her forearms, and around her face. I went traveling to find more berries that I could muster. I then told her that if she grew thirsty, all she had to do was shake the tree branches above her, and snow would fall on her lap. I didn't know how long it would take, but I had to try. After giving a tearful goodbye to my daughter, I began my trek. 
I got a large stick and began burning markers into passing trees so that I could find my way back to her. What I saw on my excursion is hard to talk about. I saw and did things I am not proud of sharing. I'm just happy that most of the more dangerous animals were hibernating. But on day 15, I almost lost hope. My daughter and I were in the snow for a total of 32 days, and half of it, I was trying to find help that felt unattainable. I barely stopped or took any breaks, I have the scars on my ankles to prove it. Then a miracle happened. I found a road. I nearly screamed with happiness. I didn't know when the next car would come, so I began walking one way. It took a few hours, but I found headlights. I cried in hysteria, barely able to form words. The couple helped me up, as at this point, I had collapsed on the floor. They sat me in their car and tried driving off, but I told them I also had a daughter in the woods, and that we had to stay and call the police to get her. There was no time for questioning, as I honestly didn't even know if she was still alive. They did as I asked, and in an hour or so, a squad of police and a helicopter came to our aid. I wish I could say it was easy to spot her, but it wasn't. It took an additional three days to find her. By the time we got to her, she was barely breathing. They were able to save her successfully, but there was a cost. Lana lost her leg due to the infection, she uses a prosthetic leg now. After getting to the hospital, and her surgery went successfully, it was time for questioning. I didn't know where to begin, so I spilled whatever would catch. I shared everything I knew about Stephen and how we got to the woods. I soon discovered that he had gone missing at the same time as us. Allegedly, he never came home, so our entire family thought we were all dead. I couldn't believe it. He must be hiding and changed his name or something. It took months to find him, but when we did, I knew what I was going to do. He was no longer in America, nor was his name Stephen. David lived in Australia, and he was getting married very soon to a beautiful young woman. After the legal team of America organized with Australia, we had a chance to get him. They had to be quick and quiet about it, as he could easily slip away again. While working on the case, I became close with Detective Seth on the scene. I had one favor to ask him. Let me be there. I don't know if that's possible, but please. I want to look into his eyes when I ruin the future he dreamed of, leaving his daughter and wife dead for a month in the snowy nights and then running across the country to get married. He deserves humiliation. He sat there a second, staring at his cup of coffee before turning to his computer to type away. Lana and I began getting ready to travel once again. We hadn't ridden a plane since coming back home from Alaska. She was nervous to see her father face to face again. I didn't blame her, but she was the strongest teenager I have met yet. When we got to Australia, Seth informed me of the plan. The wedding was happening in the afternoon, and the police were going to surround the building. We would enter right before they would come in and arrest him. I am getting nervous now, but I couldn't show it with Lana by my side. We dressed in all black dresses, symbolizing the death of our family. When we got to the venue, I squeezed my daughter's hand, giving her a smile of encouragement. I opened the door to the chapel, the people sitting looked behind them, eyes drawn in confusion. Stephen and his bride were too preoccupied to look, along with the marriage officiant. It appeared they were at the end of their ceremony, quite literally tying the knot. So I said, hi, Stephen. His smile dropped, and he finally looked our way. His skin turned pale. Hi, Dad, Lana said, limping forward to show off her prosthetic. Did you miss us? A man from the crowd began to yell at us to get out, but at this point, it didn't matter. The police walked right past Lana and me and straight toward Stephen. He was put under arrest. Stephen was charged with double attempted murder in the first degree, and he was going to serve life in prison with no possibility of parole. My daughter and I went to therapy throughout all this, and we actually met up with his almost wife-to-be, she was lovely. Seth and I began dating soon after, and I was as happy as could be. So, um, what do you guys think of my story? What would you have done differently? 
tell us down below in the comments. I'm a teacher, so foreign languages. If you had listened every time I opened my mouth, you would have known, and you wouldn't have had this problem. Hello, I'm Audrey, a teacher responsible for not one, not two, but a whooping 15 sections, each brimming with around 40 students. Let me tell you about the day I have never been more thankful for my low-paying profession because it saved my life. It all started when I was sitting in the living room grading my students' exams. I had just finished eating and realized that Matthew was still talking to his mother on the phone. They had been on it ever since this morning, and their conversations were endless. At first, I smiled to myself, thinking it was sweet he was close to his mom. But as time went on, I noticed just how clingy he was with her. Hey, babe, do you want to take a break from that call first and eat your lunch? I asked. What was that? Yeah, no, I'll eat later. I'm just attending to something right now, he replied. I sighed inwardly, feeling disappointed at my husband's actions. It wasn't the first time he had brushed off my attempt to connect with him. I knew his relationship with his mother was important, but sometimes it felt like I was competing for his attention. I often found myself holding back from sharing my thoughts and experiences with him, knowing that he wouldn't fully understand. I couldn't help but wonder why he was so focused on that, to the point where he was unable to show genuine interest in my life. It felt like I was talking to a child who missed his mother too much instead of a husband. As the weeks passed, I couldn't shake the feeling of being sidelined in Matthew's life. It seemed like his world revolved around his mother and his interests, leaving little room for me and our family. The strain on our relationship was becoming more and more evident, and I couldn't help but wonder about its impact on our child. Like when I received an invitation from our child's school for an award ceremony where they were going to be recognized for their academic achievements. Hey, Matthew, the school is having an award ceremony for our child. Our daughter is getting a medal for her hard work. Yeah, wow, uh, that's great, I guess. I know Ellie is very excited about it, and it would mean the world to her if we come and support her. It's going to be tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Starlight Ballroom. Okay, noted, he glanced up briefly, but then his attention returned to his phone. I doubted he actually heard the details of the event, and I didn't think he would actually make an appearance. The day came, and I was right. He didn't come. I couldn't believe how he would miss such an important milestone in our child's life. I knew how much our child had been looking forward to having us there. I couldn't erase my memory of the look on Ellie's face as she cried when she realized her father was nowhere to be found. When her name was called to the stage, she proudly walked up to receive her award, but as she stood there looking out onto the crowd, there was disappointment in her eyes. I want to show him my award. Why isn't he here? Ellie asked. Mom, where's Dad? I honestly don't know, sweetheart. I told him all the details. Maybe he had some emergency to attend. I'm so sorry, honey. Ellie nodded and went silent. I could see the hurt in her eyes. I didn't know what the important thing was that Matthew had been exerting all his time and energy for. Every time I saw him, he was always on his phone, still talking to his mother about something I had no knowledge about. There was also that one evening when we sat down for dinner, the light suddenly went out. I let out a frustrated sigh as I fumbled around in the darkness, searching for candles and matches. Matthew, did you remember to pay the electricity bill? I told you before how the due date for our bills was near, and they may cut it off if we didn't pay on time. Oh, right. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Just be quiet because my mother's on the phone. I rolled my eyes at Matthew's habit of neglecting responsibilities, no matter how many times I reminded him. This was becoming a major source of frustration for me. The following day, as I prepared to take a shower, I turned on the water, only to find out there was none. Matthew, did you forget the water bill too? How many times do I have to remind you about our bill's due dates? We have discussed this behavior of yours too many times. When will you listen? Oh, oops, my bad. Totally my fault. 
Matthew's lack of concern was unbelievable. How could he be so careless about such basic responsibilities? It was like he lived in his own little world, oblivious to the consequences of his actions on our daily lives. If you think his irresponsibility ended there, you're wrong. Oh, how I wish it ended there. But then one afternoon, as I returned home from work, I noticed an eerie silence in the house. Our fish, Tang, which usually provided a calming background noise, was oddly quiet. My heart sank as I approached the tank and saw our beloved pet fish floating lifelessly on the surface. No, no, Matthew. I told you to feed the fish before we left the house. Oh, I forgot. Did you even remind me? I told you to remind me. I did countless times. Our poor fish had paid the price for his negligence once again. It may seem like a small thing for some, but it was another example of his inattentiveness and absent-mindedness that took away his ability to take responsibility and care for the things and people that matter to us. He always looked at us with nonchalant eyes, as if we were the least of his priority and at the bottom of his list of concerns. No matter how much this attitude and behavior of my husband hurt me, I can't help but be thankful for it. As it turns out, it became the key to saving my life. One evening, as I was finishing up some work at home, Matthew approached me with a serious expression on his face. He finally paid attention to me without me having to initiate it, a rare occurrence, truly. The sudden change was definitely new, so I gave him my full attention. Hey, Audrey, my mother is coming over tomorrow to talk to you about something important. I raised an eyebrow, curious about what this could be about. Is this finally the time he's going to let me in on what his mother and he has been talking about? Is he finally sharing the details of their lengthy conversations that I feel so out of place in? Just remember, try your hardest to listen to what she says, okay? And do as she says. She loves respect, and she can be extremely scary when she's upset. Trust me, I've seen that side of her, and let me tell you, it's not pretty. That's a bit weird, Matthew. I don't understand why I need to listen to everything she says. I'm an adult, not a child. I have my own mind and opinions. I'm not going to be a doormat just because she does not approve of me. I know, but just this once, can you do it for me? It will make things easier for both of us, especially you. Simply being a teacher and not earning a lot, my mother already looks down on you hard. Can you really afford to get on her bad side? No, right? Now, obey. His words stung, and it was highly offensive. I felt frustrated and hurt, but I couldn't do anything but suppress it. I didn't want to cause unnecessary family drama or tension between us three. Besides, it wouldn't kill me if I did it for both of them just this one time. Reluctantly, I agreed, but deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. Why do I have to appease his mother and silence my own feelings and values? The next day, as Claire arrived, I greeted her politely and tried to be as accommodating as possible. She had a stern expression, and I could feel her scrutinizing me as we talked. She began discussing various things, from family matters to her expectations of the future. As I listened, I couldn't help but feel like I was being judged and assessed. It was as if she was testing me to see if I was worthy of her son, but like she had already made up her mind about it. As we sat in the living room, I noticed Matthew heading to the kitchen to prepare some tea. I tried to cater to a typical mother-in-law standard, thinking of offering Matthew some help. But before I could stand, Claire sternly insisted that I remain seated. Oh, uh, I was going to help Matthew with the tea. No need, sit back down. He's a grown man he doesn't need any petty help. It's just tea, after all, darling. It was odd, but I complied with her request, not wanting her to feel disrespected. When Matthew returned with the tea, they both began speaking in broken Spanish. Say servant. I grew pale with fear, not because they were speaking a foreign language that I couldn't understand, I understood them perfectly, but because of what they said. Claire asked if Matthew already mixed something in the tea, 
and Matthew replied that he already did and that he was sure it would poison me. This was so alarming and sent shivers down my spine. Is this why they have been on the phone 24-7 every day of the week? This was what they have been talking about, planning about. I am so disappointed in myself for not knowing better and letting this slide before. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves. My mind raced with thoughts, knowing I had to be cautious and play along as if I understood nothing. It was as if my knowledge of Spanish had become my secret weapon, giving me an advantage in this dangerous situation. Every fiber of me urged me to protect myself from their deceitful plot. Oh, I didn't know you guys can speak Spanish. Oh yeah, we can. Didn't I tell you that before? I must have. You should have been paying more attention to what I said to you, Audrey. He's the one to talk, and he never told me. By the way, terrible lie. Anyway, my mother just asked if the tea tastes good, and I said, of course. Do you want to take a sip? Uh, oh. Um, actually, I'll have it later. I'm not in the mood for tea right now. What's the matter with you? Just drink it. It's not a big deal. We continued to talk, and my mother-in-law and husband kept glancing at the tea, evidently growing more and more impatient with my refusal to drink it. Claire commanded Matthew to make me drink the tea. Hey, my mother is feeling disrespected. She thinks you're a bad wife for not drinking the tea I made. Go ahead, baby. Claire said she will make him drink the poisonous tea if I didn't drink it. Out of panic, that's when Matthew succumbed to extreme measures. Honestly, with that threat, I can't blame how he reacted. Matthew took a cup of tea and brought it nearer to my face. He used his other hand to pry my closed mouth so I would ingest the drink. I smacked the tea away, the cup breaking into fragments on the floor. Hablo Español. I shouted that I speak Spanish, and Claire and Matthew froze, their faces turning pale as the reality of their mistakes dawned on them. I, how? I'm a teacher, so of foreign languages. If you had listened every time I opened my mouth, you would have known, and you wouldn't have had this problem. Claire and Matthew exchanged guilty glances, realizing the severity of their actions. I had outsmarted them, using my profession to turn the tables on their dangerous plan. They had underestimated me, assuming I was oblivious to their schemes, but now their secret was out in the open. What? You must have misunderstood. Our accents were terrible. We didn't do anything. Here, I'll prove it to you. Desperate to prove their innocence, Matthew absentmindedly poured poison tea into his cup and drank it. Matthew, what are you doing? That's poisoned. Claire smacked the cup away from his mouth, but she was too late since the cup was now empty. See? By the way, you both would fail if you were in my class. Next time you plan to poison someone, don't rely on Google Translate for your little schemes. Your Spanish was terrible. With that, I walked away, leaving Claire and Matthew to confront the consequences of their actions. I knew that I had to protect myself and put an end to their toxic behavior. From that moment on, I prioritized my own well-being and stood up against anyone who tried to take advantage of me. I found my voice as I used a different language, and I wouldn't let anyone silence it again. As the days passed, Matthew's health deteriorated rapidly, and he was rushed to the hospital after experiencing severe symptoms from ingesting the poison tea. In the hospital, Claire was beside her son, filled with guilt and worry about how their plan had backfired. Matthew eventually recovered from the ordeal, but our relationship was irreparably damaged. I couldn't forgive him for what he had done, and I knew it was time to let go and move on. The divorce was a painful process, but I made sure I got full custody of our daughter, Ally. We emerged from it stronger than ever. I never thought I would feel grateful for Matthew's disinterest in my career and assumptions that I was just a teacher. My identity as a foreign language teacher had saved me from being completely blindsided by their evil plans. Cheers to a life free from poison, and may I never have to drink from that cup again. Again, that's just excuses. Don't be deceived by those. 
she's really dumb. She didn't even finish college. Uh, really? She's dumb. Well, she wasn't when she was working with me to build the school. What are you talking about? She's worked with you before. Why did I never hear about this? Uh, she's technically a co-founder of the school. Hi there, I'm Lisa, Anthony's ex-wife. Let me tell you about the time when my husband still got schooled, even though between us two, he was the only one who got to finish schooling. You see, when he was still my husband, Anthony had this hobby of making me doubt my intelligence. At first, it was subtle, with remarks here and there that made me question myself. But over time, it became more evident as he consistently belittled my opinions and treated me like a child that couldn't make her own decisions. It was exhausting, and I grew tired of feeling like I wasn't smart enough for him. It seemed like no matter what I did, I couldn't escape the feeling that I wasn't good enough in his eyes. As I sat down with a heavy heart, I recalled all the times Anthony made me doubt myself. It wasn't just one or two isolated incidents. There were countless moments when his words chipped away at my confidence. I remember the time we were at a family gathering at Anthony's parents' house, discussing a recent news event. He simply rolled his eyes and chuckled as he dismissed my opinions as naive and uninformed. Oh, Lisa, you always have the most naive views on things. You should really educate yourself more before speaking and hope that one day you can actually contribute something valuable to the conversation. Feeling frustrated and hurt, I tried to stand my ground. My views are based on my understanding of the situation. I may not have all the facts, but that doesn't mean my opinion is invalid. But Anthony's condescending tone and his family's nods of agreement made me feel like an outsider among them. Then there was also that time when we tackled some home repairs together. As I suggested a solution to fix a leaky faucet that's been making our water bill more expensive, Anthony smirked and shook his head. That's not how it's done, Lisa. Let me handle this. I think this is too complicated for your brain. I felt a mix of frustration and anger bubbling inside me. I wasn't a home repair expert, but I know I am at least capable of learning and helping. I can't handle it. Just show me what to do, and I'll follow your lead. He reluctantly showed me how to fix the faucet, but his demeaning attitude, acting disappointed with my every move, made the experience far from enjoyable. One particular incident stood out vividly in my mind. It was when I mentioned that I was considering going back to school to finish my degree. I saw skepticism in his eyes. Do you really think you can handle college after all these years? It's not as easy as you think. I'm not even sure if you're cut out for that. It's a competitive field, and you need to be really smart and driven to succeed. It didn't take me long to realize that Anthony's constant belittling was rooted in the fact that I hadn't finished college. He knew that I had left my studies due to personal circumstances, but instead of being understanding, he used it as ammunition to make me feel inferior. I couldn't help but feel constantly judged for a choice I had to make years ago, one that has shaped me into the strong and capable person I am today. I had built a successful career and created a loving home for our daughter, but Anthony's attitude seemed to undermine all of that. As I mustered the courage to have that difficult conversation with Anthony, life had a cruel way of intervening. Before I could confront him about his hurtful behavior, I received a shocking revelation. Anthony had already left me for another woman. It was midnight when it happened. Anthony had just walked through the door, looking disheveled and guilty. It was evident that he had just come from spending time with someone else, and my heart sank as the pieces started to fall into place. Anthony, where have you been? Why did you come home so late, looking like you just did the deed with someone else? Anthony tried to avoid my gaze. Look, it's not what you think. I can explain. Sure, go ahead and explain then. I'm listening. It's so complicated. I was just. I was just. You were what? Actually, you know what? I'm not even going to try and lie about it. This is my chance to break up with you. I'm cheating on you with someone else. What? I said. 
Lisa, don't make this harder than it has to be. I'll pack up my things and leave tomorrow. People break up, it's natural. Let's all be mature about this. Are you serious about this? This is all so sudden, and you don't even look affected for one bit, not one remorse. What about our daughter? Don't you care about her? I can't just stay with you just for her, it won't be fair to any of us. I didn't even plan for this to happen, I just can't deny my feelings anymore. This woman that I'm now sleeping with, she is just so intelligent, ambitious, and beautiful. She challenges me, and she can keep up with me, unlike you. I was so offended by the fact that he would even list down the things he loves about her, like a teenager describing his first crush to his mother. I feel so hurt and angry about how he could be this insensitive and disrespectful. All right, Anthony, I don't need to hear all the details. If you want to be with her, then so be it. Just go. At first, the news left me devastated and heartbroken. I couldn't help but wonder if all his belittling comments were about this other woman. Did he compare me to her constantly? Did he feel embarrassed to be with someone who hadn't finished college while she was accomplished and intelligent? It felt like my worth had been reduced to a simple educational qualification. But as days turned into weeks, something inside me shifted. I realized that his leaving wasn't a reflection of my worth or intelligence, it was about his insecurities and the flaws in our relationship. In a way, his departure was a wake-up call for me. It made me see that I deserved better, someone who loved and respected me for who I was without judgment or comparison. Still, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling in the back of my mind. While I firmly believe that educational attainment doesn't define a person's worth, I couldn't ignore the societal pressures and biases that still existed. I knew that in the real world, there might be people who would judge my daughter just as Anthony judged me. It would hurt me to witness my own daughter be bullied by others based on superficial measures like education. Because of this, I vowed to provide my daughter with every opportunity to succeed and flourish. I aimed to equip my daughter with the tools to face the world confidently, regardless of the challenges that might come her way. Enrolling her in the most prestigious school became my mission, driven by the desire to give her a head start in life and empower her to believe in herself and her capabilities. Researching the top schools in the area, I was well aware that the journey wouldn't be easy. The competition was fierce, and there were no guarantees of acceptance. However, my determination led me to do whatever it took to provide my daughter with the best chance possible. As the day for my daughter's school enrollment interviews approached, a mix of excitement and anxiety filled me. Arriving at the prestigious school, I tightly clutched Dia's hand, feeling my heart skip a beat when I spotted Anthony in the distance. He was with his new wife and their child, the life he had chosen over ours. Seeing them together brought back a flood of emotions, and sadness lingered in my heart. Anthony boldly approached us, acting as if nothing had ever happened between us. His words were dismissive and belittling, discouraging us from even attempting the interview. Despite his attempts to undermine us, I stood firm in advocating for Jia's right to a fair chance. Jia, a bright and capable young girl, deserved the opportunity like everyone else. As Anthony walked away, I couldn't believe that even in our separation, he found a way to sneak in and belittle me once more. Taking a deep breath, I reminded myself that this day was about Jia and her future. I wouldn't let anything distract me from supporting her in this crucial step of her life. As Jia and I were about to enter the interview room, I noticed Anthony's gaze fixated on someone behind us. Turning to see, I observed a man heading in our direction. As he drew closer, my heart skipped a beat, it was the dean of the school, a distinguished figure I knew well. Anthony interrupted, stepping forward with a smug grin on his face, eager to once again make a show of belittling me. Oh, there you are. Are you the interviewer? He quipped, his tone laced with condescension. I must say, be patient with them, though. They can be a bit slow. I should know. I used to live with them. His remarks caused my cheeks to flush with a mix of embarrassment and anger. I wanted to tell him to stop, but I held my tongue, 
unwilling to cause a scene in front of diameter excuse me, I replied, maintaining composure. Yes, I'm here for the interview. Anthony continued his taunts, attempting to undermine my presence. I'm telling you one time, he asserted with a dismissive tone, she struggled to help Jia with her homework, and I bought her a jigsaw puzzle that she took hours to finish. I can't even believe she had the nerve to actually step into this school. Anthony continued his belittling, claiming that my struggles with Jia's homework and the jigsaw puzzle were mere excuses. He asserted that I was truly dumb and hadn't even finished college. I couldn't hold back any longer, responding, I struggled with Jia's homework and the jigsaw puzzle because I had to juggle it with household chores. You never offered to help me with that. Don't be deceived by those. She's not dumb, she didn't even finish college because she had to stop for a while. I went on to reveal a part of my past that Anthony had never bothered to explore. Well, she wasn't dumb when she was working with me to build a school, I declared. Anthony, clearly taken aback, questioned my statement. What are you talking about? She's worked with you before. Why did I never hear about this? With a sense of pride and gratitude, I shared, yeah, and that's why she had to stop college for a while. I am eternally grateful for her dedication and intelligence. She's technically a co-founder of the school. Anthony's jaw practically dropped upon hearing this revelation. Unable to comprehend what he had just heard, it was as if a whole new side of me was disclosed, a side he had never known or bothered to explore. In disbelief, he faced the reality that he had underestimated and belittled the woman who stood before him. As the dean of the school entered the scene, Anthony felt a surge of embarrassment and shame. He realized the gravity of his ignorance, standing in front of the father of the woman he had belittled and underestimated for years. The dots connected in his mind, and he couldn't escape the consequences of his actions. Jia, you should be proud of your mother. She's a brilliant woman and played a significant role in making this school what it is today, the real interviewer remarked, addressing diameter. As the dean of the school greeted us, Anthony's face turned pale with disbelief. He had been expecting the man to be the one conducting the interview, not realizing that the esteemed figure standing before him was the dean of the school. Good afternoon, Mr. Castillo, the dean acknowledged. Um, I apologize for the delay. No problem at all. Thank you for coming, Mr. Castillo replied. The dean then instructed, go ahead and proceed with the interviews. The shift in Anthony's demeanor was evident as he now faced the consequences of underestimating both Jia and me, realizing the significant role I had played in the school's establishment. Wait, you're the dean. Yes, I am, affirmed the dean, addressing Anthony's lack of awareness. And I must say it's incredibly not smart to be unaware of that fact when you're enrolling here. Now, I believe you have wasted enough of your time. I think you're smart enough to just walk away. At that moment, Anthony's arrogant demeanor crumbled as he was humbled by the revelation. Mumbling a quick goodbye, he left the room without a word. As the door closed behind him, I felt a sense of relief, validation, and a profound vindication. With newfound confidence, I entered the interview room with Jia, knowing that I had nothing to be ashamed of. My past accomplishments and contributions were valued and recognized by none other than the dean himself, a man who had witnessed my intelligence and dedication firsthand. Jia's interview went exceptionally well, and I couldn't be prouder of my daughter's poise and confidence. She answered every question with intelligence and maturity, and I knew deep in my heart that she had what it took to excel in this prestigious school. No doubt, Jia had left a lasting impression, making a strong case for herself. Leaving the school that day, I felt a sense of relief and pride. Anthony's attempts to undermine us had failed, and Jia had proven her worth all on her own. A few days later, we received the news we had been waiting for, Jia was accepted into the prestigious school. The joy and pride in her eyes were enough to drown out all of Anthony's hurtful comments. Jia had proven that she was more than capable, and I couldn't have been happier for her. I realized it didn't matter what Anthony or anyone else thought of us. We didn't need his approval or validation. What mattered was our belief in ourselves and our ability to rise above the negativity. 
As for Anthony, his words had lost their power over me. It was also too late when he realized that not only did his words and actions fail to sabotage Jia's chances, but he had also potentially hindered his own child's success. The encounter with the Dean had not only exposed his ignorance but also shattered the illusion he had created for himself. Turns out life's enrollment interview had a surprise twist, and it wasn't just Dia who aced it but Karma too. Better luck next enrollment, I guess. Yes, no, no way. Tell me this isn't true. You're so funny. Why are you acting like this? You can't waste good meat. What have you done? He was my friend. He was my buddy. Oh, I'm going to be sick. People always say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, but let me tell you about the time when food caused two broken relationships. It all started when I couldn't contain my excitement as I chatted enthusiastically with my friends at a quaint coffee shop. My eyes sparkled with joy as I spoke about my new relationship with Alex, a food blogger known for his culinary adventures around the world. You won't believe the amazing life we lead. Alex's job takes us to so many countries, and we get to savor the most exquisite dishes from every corner of the globe. Our taste buds are in a constant state of bliss, I shared. My friends leaned in, captivated by my tales of gourmet delights and worldly adventures. They were amazed by how Alex's passion for food had become a full-fledged career that allowed us to travel and eat to our heart's content. Alex is such a food enthusiast that he even started a YouTube channel where he shares his food journeys. His followers, including me, of course, can't get enough of his reviews and mouth-watering recipes, I continued. As I shared more about our extraordinary life together, I couldn't help but mention Alex's charming little pet rabbit that had become a constant companion to both Alex and me. You won't believe how adorable it is. Alex's pet rabbit, named Bun Byun, accompanies him on his adventures, and Bun Byun has quite a refined palate too. We often joke that the rabbit is like a food taster, sniffing out the best dishes wherever we go. Bun Byun rates the food they eat. That's so adorable. This Alex guy sounds like the perfect guy, exclaimed my friend. He truly is. I'm so lucky. He's such a cute little foodie, I replied. Oh, does Alex do all the cooking, then? Not always. He's the food expert, of course, but sometimes he's too tired to cook, so I do it for him. Isn't it pressurizing to cook for someone who knows so much about food? What if Alex becomes picky and doesn't like it? I would rather die than have my husband dislike my cooking. If he starts to gag or if he spits it out, oh well. I never really saw it that way. I mean, sure, he has a sophisticated palate and can be quite particular about certain flavors, but I think he enjoys my cooking anyway. He never commends something bad about any dish I've prepared. Well, of course, he doesn't. You're his wife. He wouldn't say it to you directly. Aren't you curious about what his true opinions are? That little question from my friend resonated with me. While I cherish the opportunity one get to cook for Alex, it did sometimes make me anxious. What if my flavors don't match his expectations? What if I disappointed him with a poorly executed dish, and he's just keeping it all to himself? That would be so embarrassing. So, I rushed home to find out the truth. I came home that evening just in time to make dinner. As I took a peek at the kitchen, I saw Alex already standing there, preparing the ingredients for the meal he was about to cook for us. Since my friend's question earlier still lingered in my mind, I stopped Alex from cooking. Um, I'll cook for us tonight, honey. I want to prove my culinary skills to you, I declared. However, he seemed reluctant to let me take charge of the kitchen. No, it's fine. I can do it, he insisted. Usually, I would let him handle it, after all, he's the expert. But this time, my ego said otherwise. So, I insisted, I already said that I'll cook for us tonight. Please let me handle it. I want you to taste something. Why not? He responded, because I had a long day, and I want to eat something tasty tonight. 
I was taken aback by his response. It felt like a punch to my confidence. What's that supposed to mean? Are you saying my cooking is not tasty? I mean, come on. Do you have to ask me that? A real chef never forgets to taste his own cooking. You should have known by now, he retorted. I was incredibly offended by his response. All this time, I had put so much love and effort into my cooking, hoping it would delight Alex. Now, it was revealed that my culinary creations were not enough to satisfy him. So, all this time you didn't like my cooking? Why didn't you say so? I questioned Alex, hurt by his previous response. Because I knew you would react like this. Let's just face the fact that maybe cooking isn't just your thing, he replied. Okay, fine. I'll make something different tonight, something that will surprise you. Then you tell me your honest thoughts, I asserted. As I prepared a new recipe that I had researched on my way home from the coffee shop, my mind was filled with doubt and insecurity from what Alex had said to me. However, I was determined to prove that he was not the only one knowledgeable about food. Dinner was served, and I watched anxiously as Alex took the first bite. He chewed thoughtfully, and my heart pounded with nervousness. Well? I asked with anticipation. Well, he started, and my heart jumped with glee, thinking I had succeeded. However, his next words shattered my excitement. Wow, you wasted both of our time. It's bland, flavorless. If this is an actual food review right now, it wouldn't even make the cut for my YouTube videos. My heart sank as Alex's harsh words pierced through me, leaving me feeling crushed and defeated. I had poured my heart and soul into preparing the new recipe, hoping to prove my culinary skills to my husband. Instead, his negative review only added to my long list of doubts and insecurities. I'm sorry, Alex. I didn't mean to disappoint you. I promise I'll do better next time. I'll learn from my mistakes, sign up for workshops, and make sure to create something that truly excites your taste buds," I pleaded. But Alex seemed unmoved, his mind already made up. Here you go. I've been waiting to tell you this. It's not just about this one dish, Vanessa. It's about all your cooking. You're just not good for my brand. Who would believe that I, the food expert, would have a wife like you? They might second-guess my taste, and that will surely destroy my career. Tears welled up in my eyes as I struggled to comprehend my husband's hurtful words. I couldn't understand how my cooking had become a liability to him. Do you know how many comments I had to hide and delete from my videos since they were asking about your cooking skills? Bun Byun might die if you were to rate this one. I think it's time for us to see other people, someone on the same level as where we are in life," Alex stated. The room fell silent, the weight of his words hanging heavily in the air. It was a moment of truth where both Alex and I faced the harsh reality of our differences and the strain it had put on our marriage. A few days after our painful separation, news of Alex's new relationship spread like wildfire. Her name was Maxie, a vibrant and talented woman who was also a well-known YouTube personality in her own right. She had a channel dedicated to sharing her love for unique and exotic dishes from around the world. As the news of their relationship broke, many couldn't help but see how perfectly matched they were. Both Alex and Maxie were passionate about food, and their love for culinary exploration had brought them together. They connected through their mutual admiration for each other's YouTube channels, and it was evident that they shared a deep respect for each other's talents. Their relationship blossomed quickly, and they were often seen collaborating on exciting and unconventional cooking projects. Their chemistry, on and off screen, was undeniable, and fans couldn't get enough of their dynamic duo. They laughed, they teased, and they genuinely enjoyed each other's company, making it clear that they were not only partners in love but also in their culinary endeavors. One day, I stumbled upon a live cooking challenge on my feed. Curious, I clicked on the video and saw that it was Alex and his new girlfriend Maxie. It was a challenge where they had to be blindfolded and were tasked to surprise each other by preparing their own favorite dish. Despite the initial pang of hurt and hesitation, I decided to watch the live stream. 
Part of me still had a soft spot for Alex, and I couldn't resist seeing what he had been up to in the kitchen. Plus, I have to admit that I was a little curious about the new love of his life, Maxie. The challenge began with Maxie blindfolded, seemingly confident and playful as she tasted the dish Alex prepared for her. As Alex placed the dish in front of her, she took a bite, and her face lit up with delight. My heart sank when I recognized the dish, it was the very same one I had prepared for Alex on the night of our breakup. A wave of mixed emotions washed over me as I watched Maxie enjoy the dish. On one hand, I felt proud that he still remembered the dish I made for him that night. But on the other hand, it hurt to see him sharing such a special dish with someone else, the same dish that broke us up. Then it was Alex's turn to be blindfolded and taste Maxie's dish. I watched anxiously as Alex took his first bite, and I held my breath, waiting for his reaction. Wow, uh, the aroma is incredible. This is amazing, Maxie. I can taste the complexity of the spices and the perfect balance of flavors. The texture is superb, Alex exclaimed. I couldn't help but feel jealous and insecure as I listened to Alex shower Maxie's dish with compliments, something he couldn't do with mine. You know, I have traveled to hundreds of countries and tasted thousands of their best dishes, but this is nothing I have ever had before. Well done, my love, Alex continued. As the couple savored the moment, they shared a sweet kiss, sealing their culinary challenge with Maxie's triumph. But then, things took an unexpectedly dark turn. As Alex prepared to give his rating for the dish, he tried to call for Bun Byun, ready to include his beloved pet in the culinary evaluation. All right, with that being said, Bun Byun and I rate this dish a 100 out of, Alex started, but he noticed that Bun Byun was not in his usual spot. Wait, Bun Byun, come here. Time for the rating. That's weird, he would usually hop over to me when I call his name, Alex said, his voice trembling with worry and fear as he searched desperately for his furry friend. His calls for Bun Byun echoed throughout the room, but there was no response. Darn it, where is Bun Byun? Where's my pet rabbit? Alex exclaimed, and then it dawned on him. His expression turned from confusion to devastation as the horrifying truth sank in. He had been feasting on his beloved childhood pet, Bun Byun, without even realizing it. No, no way. Tell me this isn't true, Alex muttered, his heart breaking. I knew how much Bun Byun meant to Alex, and they had been together since the start of his YouTube channel. This revelation was a devastating blow. You're so funny. Why are you acting like this? He's just a rabbit, you know. You can't waste good meat, I said, trying to downplay the situation. Alex could only shake his head in disbelief, unable to find the words to express his feelings. The reality of the situation was too much for Alex to bear, and he was left grappling with the guilt of unknowingly partaking in a dish that held such sentimental value. What have you done? He was my friend, he was my buddy. Now I ate him. I'm going to be sick, Alex exclaimed. What's the big deal? You were feasting on it earlier like you were deprived of food and water for days. You even showered the meal with lots of compliments, and now you're going to switch up. Just get a new rabbit, they're all the same. They just differ on how you cook them, I responded, downplaying the situation. After the devastating incident, Alex couldn't bear to stay with Maxie any longer. He walked out on her, breaking off their relationship and leaving behind the woman who had callously taken away his beloved Bun Byun. The YouTube couple was never seen together again, and the fallout from their breakup was felt across social media. At first, fans were sympathetic towards Alex, offering their condolences for the loss of Bun Byun. But soon, they started to drift away from his channel. It became evident that many of his viewers had been drawn to his videos because of the adorable bunny that was a constant presence. With Bun Byun gone, there was no longer a reason for them to tune in. As the views and likes dwindled, so did Alex's income from his YouTube channel. He struggled to find new content that would captivate his audience and bring back his old fans, but it seemed like nothing could fill the void left by his dear pet. 
The once thriving channel was now slowly dying, and with it went Alex's source of income, friendships, and self-worth. Meanwhile, Maxie's career took an unexpected turn. The horrifying incident with Bun Byun made her infamous, and she became a controversial figure in the world of social media. However, she shamelessly used the scandal to her advantage, portraying herself as a bold and daring personality unafraid to take risks. Her audacious actions, combined with her new fame, catapulted her into stardom, and her followers grew rapidly. To Alex's dismay, Maxie's channel flourished while his own channel withered away. It was a bitter blow for him, and he decided to retire from his career, claiming he was so traumatized that he could barely eat anymore since every bite tasted like Bun Byun. If only he had a rabbit's foot to keep him away from all these unlucky incidents. Oh wait, he already ate it. Mom, what did you do? I destroyed everything, Angelo. Your precious house is in shambles. This is what happens when you choose that which over me. Let's see if you would still want to stay here now that everything's in pieces. Now, will you come to visit me? There's nothing to see here anymore. Mom, listen to me. You need to get out of here immediately. Hello, I'm Bao, my husband Angelo and I just bought a new house in a new city. But because of what my mother-in-law did, I think we're not the only ones who are going to move out. Moving to a new city with Angelo was both exciting and liberating. Our decision to find a fresh start in a different place was fueled by our desire to escape the constant interference of my mother-in-law, Hazel. Our old house had been marred by her unannounced visits and relentless critiques, making it difficult for us to enjoy the peace and privacy we craved. Hazel's unexpected visits were like a never-ending nightmare. It didn't matter what time of the day it was or what we were doing, she would just show up unannounced and make herself at home. I vividly remember one particular occasion when she barged in while we were having a relaxing afternoon on the couch. Knock, knock, she announced. Angelo and I exchanged a quick glance, knowing that Hazel never bothered to wait for an invitation. Oh, nothing. I just thought I would drop by to see how you're managing this hazardous place that blocks out the natural flow of energy. I bit my tongue, not wanting to engage in an argument. Our house was fine, but Hazel always found something to criticize. We're doing just fine, Mom. Thanks for your concern. Can we help you with anything? Ignoring her son's response, she continued her inspection, pointing out every flaw she could find. Look at this mess. The layout is all wrong, and don't even get me started on this color choice. It's just plain ugly. Did you even consult an architect and an interior designer for this? Actually, Angelo and I really like the layout and colors. It suits our taste perfectly, and we spent months discussing its details. You should have asked for my advice first before buying this place. I could have helped you find something better. Oh, and everything's so dirty. Have you even cleaned properly? How could you live with such filth? You might as well be homeless. Actually, we just finished cleaning before you arrived. It's spotless. My mother-in-law seemed determined to find fault in everything. We just couldn't wait for all of her ramblings to be over. After what felt like an eternity, she finally decided to take her leave. Well, I'll be going now. Make sure you take my advice and fix all the problems, Hazel declared. Her nosy, intrusive, and constant presence persisted to the point that our neighbors, who witnessed her frequent appearances, started to speculate about her relationship with Angelo and the current burglary incidents. One day, as I chatted with our friendly neighbor Mrs. Thompson, she hesitated before sharing some gossip. You know, Noella, um, I don't want to pry or stir up some non-existent issue, but I've been seeing that woman around a lot lately. Is she involved with your husband? Oh, no, no, not at all. Well, she's always lurking around your house. I wonder if she's up to something bad. Yeah, and she's always eyeing your home. It's like she's trying to find something valuable to steal. Could she be the culprit of those burglary incidents? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. To be honest, Angelo and I know that behavior of hers all too well. 
That's so scary. Should we call the police? Oh, actually, that's Angelo's mother, and yeah, she can be a bit, well, overbearing. But she's a good person once you get to really know her. I lied to them. My mother-in-law's behavior was extremely disrespectful. I couldn't help but think, why is she like that? Is she just that fond of houses? Is she really concerned for our safety, or is she just threatened that her son is now living in a different home with a different woman without her? My mother-in-law's intrusion reached a whole new level of discomfort when we were in the middle of a private moment, and Hazel showed up, barging into our bedroom without knocking, catching us both off guard. Angelo, sweetheart, I need to talk to you about something important. We quickly scrambled to cover ourselves, feeling incredibly violated and angry. Mom, can't you see we are busy? This is incredibly inappropriate. You should have at least knocked. Oh, don't be so silly. I'm family. I don't need to knock. Besides, we're all adults here. I remember when your father and I used to, get out of here immediately. Hazel finally left, and we took a moment to catch our breaths and process what had just happened. It was our last straw. It was clear that her behavior was becoming more and more invasive, and we knew we had to take a stand to protect our new life in our new home. Hazel arrived at our old house, fueled by her toxic emotions. She approached the property with a sinister determination, her plan unfolding in her mind. As she stood outside, memories of the past flooded back, and her anger intensified. Unable to control her jealousy, she decided to take revenge on Angelo for not visiting her. Quietly, she searched for a way to enter the house. The resentment she felt towards us fueled her actions. As she moved through the darkness, she couldn't help but remember the times when Angelo spent hours playing in the yard and enjoying family moments. Now, those memories only intensified her feelings of betrayal. Finding an unlocked window, Hazel slipped into the house, guided by her vengeful intentions. She moved stealthily, driven by the need to assert dominance and control over Angelo's life. The quietness of the house echoed her footsteps as she made her way through the familiar corridors, fueled by the darkness of her emotions. Once inside, Hazel began to wreak havoc. She overturned furniture, shattered glass, and vandalized the walls. Her actions were a twisted expression of the anger that had consumed her. The once peaceful home was now a chaotic scene of destruction, and Hazel reveled in the chaos she had created. Unbeknownst to us, the peaceful night was shattered by the sounds of Hazel's vengeance. Our neighbors, who had warmly welcomed us to the community, were now witnesses to the destruction taking place in our old house. The once happy memories embedded in those walls were now marred by Hazel's act of revenge. As the night unfolded, we remained blissfully unaware of the havoc that had been unleashed upon our former home. Little did we know that Hazel's jealousy would escalate to such extremes, leaving behind a trail of destruction that would alter the course of our lives in ways we could never have anticipated. We were completely unaware of the storm that was unfolding in our old house. Hazel's destructive rampage continued, fueled by her twisted emotions and a desperate need to assert her presence in Angelo's life. As she moved from room to room, leaving chaos in her wake, her words cut through the air with bitterness and resentment. The living room bore the brunt of her fury. The once intact TV screen now shattered, symbolizing the fractured relationship she believed she had lost. Hazel's destructive acts were not merely about breaking objects, they were a manifestation of her belief that she was irreplaceable in Angelo's heart. With a relentless sweep of her arm, dishes and memories crashed to the floor, accompanied by her accusations about my supposed inadequacies. The dining table became a casualty of her jealousy, and her words echoed through the chaos, questioning my ability to cook Angelo's favorite meals. In her eyes, I was an interloper, a stranger incapable of understanding his tastes and desires. A swift kick to the bookshelf sent books and trinkets tumbling, a symbolic gesture of her disdain for my supposed lack of interest in Angelo's life. In her blinded rage, Hazel failed to realize the true cost of her actions, the irreparable damage not only to the physical surroundings but also to the fragile bond with her son. 
Back in our new home, Angelo and I sat blissfully unaware of the havoc being wreaked upon our former abode. Our peaceful evening continued, wrapped in the warmth of our shared love and the hope for a brighter future. Little did we know that Hazel's destructive outburst would leave a lasting impact on the remnants of our past, shaping the trajectory of our lives in unexpected ways. Angela's phone abruptly chimed with a text notification from Hazel. The message was concise, merely stating, emergency. Our hearts raced as Angelo quickly dialed her number, bracing for the possibility of the worst. Mom, what's going on? Is everything all right? Angelo anxiously inquired. Oh, Angelo, thank goodness you called. You won't believe what just happened, his mom responded, sounding frantic. Their worries only intensified as she continued, we're here now, mom. Tell us what's wrong. Are you okay? I'm good, all right, but your house isn't. I did it, Angela. I couldn't take it anymore. I showed you, she confessed. Confused and concerned, Angelo and his sibling pressed her for more information. She began to explain, I showed you how it feels when you go away from me and disobey your mother's request. She proceeded to film her surroundings, revealing the now broken state of everything inside. At first, confusion lingered, as they were literally in their house at that moment. However, the realization dawned on them as she continued, what did you do? I destroyed everything, Angelo. Your precious house is in shambles. This is what happens when you choose that which over me. Let's see if you would still want to stay here now that everything's in pieces. Now, will you come visit me? There's nothing to see here anymore. Their hearts sank as the extent of her rage and jealousy became apparent. Looking at each other with concern, Angelo pleaded, Mom, you need to stop this right now. This is not the way to handle your emotions. Ignoring their pleas, she declared, No, I won't stop. You need to see what you're doing to me, to us. I won't let that woman take you away from me. Mom, listen to me. You need to get out of there immediately, Angelo urged. Unyielding, she replied, Oh, but I'm not done yet. There are still lots of areas I haven't thrashed. Not that it wasn't thrashed to begin with. This isn't our house anymore. We moved away a few months ago. We have a new home in a different city. Confused and shocked, Hazel asked, what do you mean? Angelo explained, we sold that to the mayor's daughter a few months ago. She paid us good money that we were able to buy this house we are currently staying in. The truth hit Hazel hard. You're going to be in big trouble if you don't leave that house immediately, Mom. Their security is uptight. But I thought you were still living here, Hazel said, her emotions in disarray. Angelo responded, we didn't tell you because we didn't want to upset you further. I knew you wouldn't be able to accept it. Get out of there now. Attempting to fix some of the damage, Hazel realized it was too late. Panicking, she tried to make a run for it, but the mayor's daughter had been watching her destructive rampage on security cameras. Police sirens wailed as officers arrived at the scene, and the mayor's daughter confronted Hazel, labeling her a pathetic burglar. Hazel froze in her tracks, the reality of her actions sinking in as the officers closed in. You have any idea what you have done? This is a criminal act, and you will be held accountable for every single piece of damage you caused, the mayor's daughter sternly addressed Hazel. Stumbling over her words, Hazel protested, I didn't mean to. I thought it was still my son's house. The mayor's daughter retorted, so, you were actually planning to destroy your son's house. How is that any better? And you dare to call yourself a mother. You know, when Angela sold me the house, he was so sweet and kind, very unlike you. The police approached urgently, surrounding Hazel as they took control of the situation. She was placed in handcuffs and led away, her head hanging in shame. The arresting officer informed her, Ma'am, you're under arrest for vandalism and destruction of property. You have the right to remain silent. She was escorted into the police car and taken to the police station, leaving behind a trail of destruction and broken relationships. 
At the police station, charges were promptly pressed, ensuring that Hazel would be held accountable for her destructive behavior. She was made to pay for every single piece of damage, the cost of which was substantial. As the day passed, Hazel remained in jail, facing the consequences of her actions. It was a harsh wake-up call, forcing her to confront the impact of her actions on her relationship with her son. As the dust settled and the shattered glass was replaced, one thing became certain, nothing could ever repair the damage done to the mother-son bond. The mayor's daughter wasted no time in pursuing justice, determined to make Hazel pay for her destructive behavior. It was a painful lesson, and Hazel's actions served as a stark reminder that sometimes, the consequences of one's choices can be irreparable. In the end, as the mother-son relationship lay in ruins, the narrator reflected, that will teach her that she's a destroyer of homes all along, not me. Hazel, next time, leave the destruction of houses to the demolition experts. That's all for today's story. If you like it, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.